And I give the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of Sri Lanka. Uh, distinguished co-facilitators, thank you for giving me the floor. Being a developed island nation in a complex world, Sri Lanka too has given thought <coughs> to the ensuing debate on the current structure of the Security Council, whether it does adequately represent the interests and concerns of developing countries. The present composition seems to suggest an imbalance, and this power imbalance undermines the ability of developing countries to have meaning, a meaningful say in important global issues uh, that have come up from time to time. It is believed that the Security Council reform should aim to address this imbalance by revisiting the composition of the Council, ensuring fair representation of developing countries. It must be appreciated that security issues often have a direct impact on developing countries, such as conflicts, terrorism, humanitarian crises. Therefore, it is essential for these countries to have a seat at the table when discussing and making decisions on these matters. We must have a Security Council that better reflects the realities of the 21st century. The question, therefore, of mandating a review clause for any future reform of the Council is an important one. What does it mean? It simply means that implementing a review clause would ensure that the Council's structure and functions are periodically evaluated and adjusted as needed to meet the evolving needs of society. There are different views on this matter. Some member states may argue that a review clause is necessary to ensure accountability and transparency in the decision-making process of the Council. It would allow for a thorough examination of the Council's performance, effectiveness, and relevance. So by conducting a periodic review, any shortcomings or inefficiencies can be identified and addressed, leading to a more efficient and effective Council. On the other hand, some member states may argue that frequent reviews could lead to instability and uncertainty. Now, they may believe that the Council's structure and function should remain stable for a certain period of time to allow for continuity and consistency in the decision-making process. They may also argue that continuous reviews could disrupt ongoing, ongoing initiatives and hinder long-term uh, long consensus, consensus and planning. Ultimately, co-facilitators, the decision of whether to mandate a review clause for any future reform of the Council depends on nothing but weighing the benefits of accountability and adaptability against the potential drawbacks, I say, of instability and disruption. It is therefore important to carefully consider these perspectives and engage in a thoughtful and inclusive dialogue to reach consensus on this matter. A quick word on regional representation. Now, this involves the allocation of seats on the Council to different regions of the world. Regional representation is important in the Security Council, undoubtedly, to ensure the interests and perspectives of different regions are adequately represented in the decision-making process. We therefore say that it be prudent for the Council to have a balanced representation of regions to enhance its legitimacy and effectiveness in addressing global security issues. Now, an in-depth discussions are therefore necessary to clarify questions regarding the specific mechanics of perhaps nomination and rotation for cross-regional groups and countries in special circumstances within the context of regional representation in the Security Council. Now, these discussions, I say, are crucial to ensure transparency, fairness, inclusivity in the nomination and rotational process. Views of these specific mechanisms and nominations and rotations may vary amongst different delegations. Some delegations may adv advocate for a system that ensures equal opportunities for all regions, as we heard just now, to participate in the Security Council, while others may prioritize considerations such as regional stability, geopolitical factors, or the representations of specific interests. Delegations might have different options on the criteria for nomination and the duration of rotation. Some may argue for a rotational system that allows for frequent changes in the membership to promote more broader participation, while others may support longer rotation to ensure continuity and expertise. Furthermore, discussions may also focus on the process of nomination, including the role of regional groups in selecting candidates and the level of transparency and accountability in the selection process. Co-facilitators, overall, 
the views of the delegations on the specific mechanisms of nomination and rotation for cross-regional groups and countries in special circumstances are likely to be diverse. It is therefore important for these views to be heard and considered in order to develop a system that ensures broader participation. Realistically, obtaining the necessary comp comp consensus for substantial reform can be challenging. It would therefore require extensive negotiations, compromise, and diplomatic efforts to convince them to support significant changes. Now, while appreciating and achieve that achieving comprehensive reform may be difficult, there are incremental steps that can be taken, and moreover, developing countries will continue and must continue to advocate for their interests and, uh, and push for more inclusive and a representative Security Council. So in conclusion, taking Security Council reform to a realistic level requires uh, perhaps acknowledging the challenges uh, and complexities involved. So while achieving comprehensive reform may be challenging, incremental steps, as I said, and diplomatic efforts can contribute to a more inclusive and representative Security Council to better address. Now, the issues. Security Council reform, while involving political considerations, diplomatic considerations, most importantly, must not forget the legal considerations in the Charter, particularly the Charter provisions. Any reform proposal must conform to the principles and provisions outlined in the United Nations Charter. The Charter establishes the structure and the functions of the Security Council and provides the framework which reform can take place. Yet, amidst all these problems, it appears that our institutions, approaches, and often perhaps our own mindsets reflect the wisdom of the century we have left behind, not the century we live in. The Security Council and we, Member States, therefore must free ourselves from those traditional moorings. Thank you. I thank the Distinguished Permanent Representative for his statement.